It is uh, really good to be with you today at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. And for those who are visiting today, we want you to know that wherever you are on life's journey, whoever you are, in your person, you're welcome here. We love it when visitors come. So, in fact, we love it so much that sometimes we actually take a moment to introduce them or have them introduce themselves. So if you are a visitor or have brought visitors and you would like to either introduce yourself or be introduced, we're going to pause for a moment for that to happen. And you can, oh, uh, we, oh, please stand. I see you just pointing to somebody. Okay, my name is Joan Brady, and this is my first time here. Say your first name again. Joan. J -O -N. Joan. J O N. Yes. Well, welcome, yes. Joan. Thank Glad you. to have welcome. you. Welcome. Hey. All right. <laughs> Jeffrey, you, you got anybody you wanna? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if you're saying be quiet, don't talk to me, or. <laughs> commit you to anything, um, but we love a record of your visit, and if you are seeking a pastoral call, then Alan Kelchner will be glad to do that sometime. Okay. I should say that for those who are visiting, this uh, we're in this sort of interim interim period where, where we've had an interim minister for about a year and a half. He's finished. And I think you all saw the announcement that Alan Clausen has been called to be the interim minister at the very church where our new pastor is coming from. At, um, yes. an, extraordinary, an extraordinarily wonderful thing, and it's, it's uh, a good thing. So I think they can stay in Sonoma, and we can probably bother them from time to time. So, isn't that a nice, nice thing? Anyway, so as I was saying, we, he's left and now we're in this interim interim where we're waiting for our new pastor to come so we have some fill-ins, <coughs> such as myself. And I dressed up for the occasion because Alan's wearing his robe, Reverend Kelchner, and I didn't want to look like a country bumpkin standing next to him. So. All right, so much for all of that. I want to direct your attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin today. We're going to hear about a couple of them um, in a moment, one, one in a moment and one later as a moment of mission. And I think the, the one I want to emphasize um, right now in this moment is the one about the 4th of July, which of course is happening tomorrow. And is as is our tradition, we park cars here for the parade in the morning, and we have a morning crew that's pretty stalwart and set to go. And then again in the evening for the fireworks that happen right behind where I'm standing virtually, a ways back. And we park cars for the fireworks 
and that's one of the ways we supplement our budget because we, I think we charge $10 or maybe it's a suggested donation, I'm not sure how we do that, but we do need some extra help from 6 to 9 p.m. Alan Kelchner and Bob Griego are heading that up for us. Thank you both very much. If you can help between 6 and 9, park cars here tomorrow evening, would you please let either Bob or Alan know after the service today? And we'll, we'll get a count and see how we're doing. So with that, I'd like to invite someone who I haven't got to hear too much speak, and so I'm looking forward to what Winston Vaughn has to tell us about the Endowment Committee. Come on up, Winston. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, we, the Endowment Committee, includes Mary Ellen and Rudy. Uh, we're hosting a brunch. The information's on the flyer. And the brunch is next Sunday for current and hopefully future members, legacy members, who would like to list our church as a beneficiary in their wills and trusts. Definition of legacy, something such as property or money that is received from someone who has died. Sounds pretty morbid. But another definition of legacy is something that has happened in the past that comes from someone in the past. Many of us leave our legacy on this church and its many missions into the world by our past actions and our future plans. We all serve this church by being here and being a part of this church in our very many committees, music and prayer groups, and the social actions that we do as a church. A few of us, though, are very blessed, and blessed to leave property and monies to this church in the trust of those that we leave behind as a community. To keep this amazing journey moving forward for many, many generations to come, we ask that you consider and act as the meaning of legacy for our church. Please consider joining the Legacy Fund and pledge towards this church's endowment. You can, you can contact Rudy, myself, or Mary Ellen at any point. And lastly, we hope to see you next week Sunday at our home three blocks from here. Uh, Jeffrey will be putting out far too much food, as usual. <laughs> so uh, come enjoy. It's from one until whenever you show up. And we look forward to you being a part of our endowment, our legacy, actions, property, and monies towards this church. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, for that. So now we sort of move from what we might call our preliminary aspects of gathering together to that which we're here for, which is to worship, which is to be present to all that God may wish to do in just the short span of an hour or so that we're together. We'll enjoy communion together later. We'll explain how we'll do that when we come to that point in the service. But right now, what we get to do is simply be, be present. A lot of things maybe we were thinking about before we came here this morning, but we don't have to think about those things right now. What we get to do right now is just be. And I like to add to that this idea of opening, you know, opening this heart that we all have. It's remarkably receptive when we allow it to be and we just open up for what the Spirit may do in our midst with the people sitting next to you and the people sitting in front of you and behind you. And in this space that we have been blessed with, we have this great opportunity for the Spirit to speak to us and for us to respond in appropriate ways. So I invite you to open your heart, to be still, and know that God is with us. And to help us with that, we'll listen to the prelude, and we'll have the lighting of the candles. <laughs>
please stand for the call to worship. This house of worship is our home. We gather here to seek hope and guidance. We come here to laugh and cry alongside dear friends and fellow travelers. We come here to find wisdom and courage for the living of these days. Come, friends, with joy and expectation. And let us worship God together. Please. Uh, Go to hymn number 594, we'll sing verses 1 through 3. <laughs> whose wrongs are pardoned. Happy is the one whom the Lord does not accuse of doing wrong and who is free from all deceit. When I did not confess my sins, I was worn out from crying all day long. I decided to confess them to you, and you forgave all my sins. So all your loyal people should pray to you in times of need. When a great flood of trouble comes rushing in, it will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will save me from trouble. I sing aloud of your salvation because you protect me. Sometimes in
The second reading this morning is from Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. Now a man called Zacchaeus was there. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to get a look at Jesus, but being a short man, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, because Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, because I must stay at your house today. So he came down and welcomed Jesus joyfully. And when the people saw it, they all complained, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, half of my possessions I now give to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone of anything, I am paying back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Well, thank you for that lovely music this morning. That was just wonderful. It's good to be back here. It's always a little strange for me to be up here in the robe instead of sitting out there among you, but I'm glad for an opportunity to do this once in a while. Do you remember a movie a few years ago called Avatar? That, it had, you know, a few too many science fiction type battle scenes in it for me, for my taste. But otherwise, it was wonderful. It was a spectacular, highly imaginative movie filled with breathtaking beauty and delight. Avatar was set many years in the future on a distant planet called Pandora. And Pandora was a, a dazzling world of, of color and fantastical, magnificent creatures and inhabited by a noble race of blue-skinned blue people called the Navi. Now, one of my favorite things about the movie was uh, the way the Navi would greet one another with the phrase, I see you. I see you, which, which meant much more than visual. When the beautiful Natira uh, greets Jake Sully with this phrase, it's more like, I see you fully. I, I get you. I understand you. It's, it's really quite lovely as people greet one another. Because, my friends, isn't this what we all want? To be seen. To be truly seen and understood and to have others know who we are. This kind of deep connection between human beings is absolutely essential. Because when it doesn't happen, when people are made to feel invisible or misunderstood or disrespected, well, then things can go very wrong. Truth is, I think this helps explain Brexit, actually. The British exit, the surprising and perplexing vote of the United Kingdom to withdraw from the European Union. Brexit wasn't supposed to happen, especially uh, since the vast majority of British politicians and business <coughs> leaders argued against it, warning their countrymen that this would be a very unwise decision, and still a clear majority voted for it. And now, here in the U.S., many are suggesting that there's a correlation between the Brexit vote and the candidacy of Donald J. Trump. <laughs> that in both cases, what's happening is that a multitude of unhappy, disaffected voters are sending a message to the establishment. Now, I've noticed that commentators tend to speak in highly derogatory terms of both Trump voters as well as Brexit voters. And so it's tempting to just dismiss them out of hand as people who are less educated or ill-informed. They're racist, we say. They're xenophobic. And I'm sure in many cases that's true. But I also want to suggest to you that what most typifies these voters is that they are people who feel invisible. In the headlong rush toward globalization and free trade and wave after wave of immigration, along with dramatic changes that have happened in social norms around gender and sexuality, in the midst of all of those, this, these disaffected voters feel like no one is considering how all of this change affects them. 
they feel ignored and overlooked and devalued. And so the protest vote, whether it be for Brexit or for Trump, is a way of demanding that somebody, somebody pay attention. Now, I don't pretend to understand or be able to explain the success thus far of Donald Trump, but I do understand at least this much, that my very own, dearly beloved, Midwestern working class brother, who is a Trump supporter, and you, and me, and every single person on this planet wants to be seen and to be understood and to have their concerns taken seriously. I once had a member of my congregation who was the CEO of a company that provided malpractice insurance for doctors. He told me that a few years before they had begun doing seminars teaching doctors how to say they're sorry. <laughs> that is, when something went wrong, when an operation or procedure went wrong, it's important for the doctor just to express compassion and to say to their patient and their family that they're sorry it happened. This is not about admitting guilt or wrongdoing. It's simply this very human thing to do to acknowledge the pain that the family and the patient are going through. And my friend, the insurance CEO, said that when doctors do this, there are better outcomes and certainly fewer lawsuits. <laughs> it's a measurable difference. The patient just needs to hear their doctor say, in effect, I see you. I get it. Susan and I had a chance this year once again to march uh, with the church ladies in the San Francisco Gay Pride Parade last Sunday. That was a great experience, so much fun. It's amazing to see people's response to our charming and pretty church ladies. <laughs> All along the parade route, there are cheers and big smiles and some tears, with people blowing kisses and thumbs up and, and, and peace signs. And also I noticed a lot of eye contact. Just, I see you here with us. Often our ladies would go right over to the crowd to give people a big hug or a high five. And Vita and Kathy, of course, drew a huge response with their, and lots of hugs as they walk along with their signs saying, uh, 38 years together. It's a happy time. But I also find the whole event quite poignant to see how much it matters to people still in 2016, how much it matters and how grateful they are for our presence in this parade. It is a stark reminder of how much our LB LGBTQ sisters and brothers have been wounded by the church. And so for them to know that they are seen and supported by us church folk matters. It makes a difference. So I'm really grateful to be part of it. Special thanks to Patricia Henley for getting us all organized and of course most of all for leading the dance routines. Just <laughs> No doubt you heard the story earlier this month of a student athlete at Stanford who had raped a young woman behind a dumpster. He was convicted on three felony counts, and the state recommended he be sent away to prison for six years. However, the judge instead sentenced him to a few months in county jail and no prison time, citing his concern for the young man's future and how hard this would be on him. This lenient sentence provoked outrage all across the country. I was outraged. Maybe you were too. The victim, the young woman who had been raped, wrote a powerful, gut-wrenching 12-page essay about what this attack had done to her and how she was dehumanized not only by the attack itself but by the whole investigation and examination process. And now this light sentence left her feeling dehumanized and victimized all over again with the concern entirely centered on the man, the perpetrator, and no regard whatsoever for what this violent attack had done to her. She felt disregarded, disrespected, and invisible. People need to be seen. A long time ago, 
long time ago, back when I was young. I was pastor of a church in a small college town in Vermont. It was lovely, it was idyllic. But then somehow I got it into my head to run for the school board. <laughs> I'm not sure what I was thinking. But, but anyway, I got elected. And, and believe me, it was quite the learning experience. experience. I learned that two things, I thought I was a pastor, people talked to me about everything, right? But then I learned that the two things people get really very emotional about are number one, their kids, and number two, their taxes. Well, a time came around to negotiate a contract, a new contract with our teachers, and by this time I was chair of the school board. And so I became the spokesperson for management, sitting across the bargaining table from the leader of the teachers union, whose name was Spencer, Spence. Our negotiations quickly became tense, and then they got downright painful as we came back to the table night after night and made the same arguments back and forth. Two sides, two intense groups facing off, and Spence and me talking at each other and talking past each other, sometimes rather loudly. It was awful. Finally, after six long months with no progress, hopelessly deadlocked, we agreed to call in a federal mediator. Mediator came, talked to us, and in one day, one day, we reached a settlement. I was shocked, we were all shocked. But what happened, what the mediator saw that we could not, did not see, was that what the teachers actually wanted was not so much the extra pay and the benefits they were demanding, what they really wanted was to be seen. They wanted to have their concerns validated. They felt like management was blowing them off and not really hearing them. And once the med med mediator helped us see that, and we were willing then to acknowledge that their concerns were legitimate, once they felt seen, then they were willing to give in on some of their demands. And, and by the same token, when our side felt like we were heard, we gave in as well. Now, I have to tell you, this. This experience had a, had a big impact on me, so much so that some years later, we were living in Boise, Idaho, and I took classes at a law school, and I became a licensed professional mediator, certified by the Idaho Supreme Court. I did some labor mediation, but mostly what the court had me doing was divorce mediation. <laughs> Talk about painful. <laughs> But what I discovered through this experience over and over is that when people truly feel listened to and understood by the other party, they are so much more willing to be flexible. Often, what they needed more than anything else was to have their concerns validated. Sometimes all they really wanted was for the other person to say, in effect, I see you, I, I get it. And you know, sometimes that actually happened. And when it did, oh my gosh, it was gospel. It was so beautiful. Another thing I learned doing divorce mediation is that the closer people are, the more intimately they know each other, the more they assume that they know what the other person's thinking or what the other person wants. Sometimes the closer we are to someone, the more we assume that we already know what they're going to say or what they're thinking. And so we tune them out and we stop seeing them. We stop hearing them. Now I want to say a word about something closer to home, namely our sanctuary remodeling proposal. Some of you may have guessed I'd get around to this topic. First of all, I want to say that I am so excited about the proposed remodeling plan. I know the church has been talking about this for for many years, and now the time has come to finally do it, to actually do it. And we're so fortunate to have the, the Edder funds that have given us the push to move forward. We're also fortunate to have such a, a hardworking and talented sanctuary remodeling committee. It's a challenging project with lots of constraints in this building. And I think this group has done some, some really wonderful design work. However, I do also have some concerns about a couple of aspects of the plan. But most of all, my concern is about process. I just want to be sure that every single person in this wonderful congregation has a chance to be heard and to have their concerns taken seriously. And the thing about it, dear friends, is that we know how to do this. 
In this church, we are truly good at seeing and hearing each other. To be perfectly honest and personal, one of the reasons Susan and I were attracted to this church, and, and we visit a lot of other churches, the reasons we were attracted here is that we could tell early on was that this was a place where we could be known and valued. We quickly discovered that this church community is a place where people really do listen to each other and see each other in a deep way and genuinely care about each other. I see you. It is a simple and powerful gift that we can give each other. And of course, it is Jesus who taught us how to do this. One of the most amazing and marvelous things about Jesus is that he could see people. I mean, he really did see them. Whether it was a woman of ill repute who was about to be stoned, or a rich young ruler on a spiritual quest, or a leper, or a blind beggar, or a hated tax collector, Jesus could see the humanity and worth of every person. Today's Gospel reading is a case in point. When people looked at Zacchaeus, what they saw was a man who was a traitor to the human race, a monster who cheated them out of their livelihood. But when Jesus looked at Zacchaeus, that's not what he saw at all. Now, if you look at the bulletin cover for today, that colorful co cover, I didn't choose it because of its intrinsic artistic value. But I chose it just because Jesus and Zacchaeus, look, both of them look so darn happy, right? I love that warm and welcoming smile on the face of Jesus. In fact, that's how I think of Christ. Not all solemn and pious and kind of sour looking, you know, but warm and welcoming. I think of Jesus as a, an attractive and charismatic figure. That's how I picture him. And you can see the impact that it has on Jesus, when, when, or excuse me, on Zacchaeus, when Jesus says to him, in effect, I see you. I see you are a real human being, not a monster. And I'd like to come have dinner with you. For Zacchaeus, this validation, this affirmation, brings about a dramatic transformation. He climbs down from that tree, and by the time his feet hit the ground, he is a new man. Half of everything I own, I'm going to give away to the poor, he says, and then he offers to pay back fourfold to everyone he's defrauded over the years. So Zacchaeus, in effect, takes his vow of poverty right there before their eyes, and he does it joyfully and ecstatically because now he has what money could never buy him. He is seen and valued as a human being. Dear friends, what Jesus did for Zacchaeus is what we are called to do for each other. We're called simply to, to truly see the other person. To say, I see you, means to embrace them fully, including what they think, what they value, their crazy ideas, their heartaches, their hopes, their joy, their grief. For human beings to do this for one another is a noble calling. It is what the world needs. It's what our church needs. By the grace of God, may you and I rise to the challenge. Amen.
hearts when we met for worship that you would be with us. You're always with us, but sometimes we're not conscious of it. Sometimes we forget. But when we're gathered in community like this, it is so much easier to remember. So much easier to feel that this distance that sometimes happens between divinity and humanity, that that gulf is closed. And we can actually feel it, we can sense it in our bodies, we can feel it in the air. And such is our experience here. We are grateful that we can carry all of our concerns to you, both large and small, spoken or unspoken. You receive them all. You hear them all. You see us. You know us. You love us. We receive your love. We receive your sight. Your blessing. We're so grateful for these times in life when we feel like you are so close to us. Our hope is that we can carry this into the world because the world is hurting so much in so many places. And we want to be ambassadors of your love. We, we want to carry your divinity into this world as divine beings ourselves. So help us to do that. Help us to take what we've experienced here and bring it to this world that you love. Thank you for Jesus and how he showed us that that could be done by seeing people, by touching them, by excluding no one. So of course we're so pleased to have this prayer that he taught us and to be able to pray it in his name just as he taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Very happy to have Susan Kelchner come and share with us a moment for a mission. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about a pastor's housing fund. As you know, I served on the search committee um, that's bringing current to us in just another month. Well, hang on. Um, as we did our work, we could not get away from the fact that the cost of housing in our valley is a real deterrent for many candidates who might have liked to come and join us. Um, we don't have a traditional parsonage to house a pastor. We don't have a huge endowment fund where we can gain funds to help our new pastor gain a home. So for months, we tried to figure out what can we do about it. And then we called Curran to be our pastor and she has a relatively small but a real need for some housing, financial housing assistance. As many of you know, because you've been there, you gave your time, you gave your hours, you've been to their new home, they found this wonderful, small, modest place um, to make their home in their own sanctuary. But when it came to closing on the house, they were $12,000 short and had to take out a small, a short-term loan to fill that gap. 
So the search committee went back to work and we looked around at what kind of options we might have and following a model that many other churches are using, we created a proposal uh, which we presented to church council and which they approved to create a pastor's housing fund. And the way this fund works is to make a low interest loan to the pastor and we secure that with a promissory note between the two parties and then the pastor would pay interest only annually on that loan as long as they own the home or are in our employ, whichever those comes first, then the principal is due. So if they sell the house or if they're no longer a pastor, they need to sell to pay back that loan. Um, this kind of a fund, it's called a revolving fund, that's a financial term, where all the interest payments and the principal repayment all go back into the fund to replenish it. Um, and then the fund is available to loan out again for future pastors. It's a real win-win kind of a situation for everyone. So this pastor's housing fund is now open for donations. And to date, we have verbal commitments of about $4,500 toward our $12,000 goal. And if you would like to contribute to this legacy, you just indicate on your gift to the church that it's for the pastor's housing fund. Um, everybody wins. You get a tax break. The pastor gets the loan. The monies come back to the church to be there and available for future pastors. So if you have any questions about it, you can talk to me about it or Ray Snipes, and we would be glad to help, and we're ready to take any checks that anyone would like to give. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, please note that uh, immediately following the offertory, uh, we're going to uh, ask you to stand and sing. We'll not do the doxology and stand. We'll, we'll stand and sing uh, the next hymn, which is the communion hymn, I Come With Joy, verses 1, 2, and 5. Dear friends, we have such an abundance of gifts to offer. The use of our hands in cooking and maintaining and fixing things, the use of our minds in creative thinking and design and problem solving, curiosity, compassion, the patience to wait, the courage to act, spiritual depth, financial resources, faith, hope, and love. All of these things are symbolized in the gifts that we offer for the work of our church. Let us now worship God with our morning offerings.
to bless us and this world. Amen. For communion this morning, we're going to do as we did the last time. It's a, a lot of you weren't here for that, so I will explain briefly how we will do that. We have Elizabeth Palmer and Beth Pearson from the worship committee in the back. And they're going to begin by releasing the very back row. And um, if you wish to come forward, you'll come on this side, on Alan's side of the aisle, and receive the bread from Alan. And then uh, I will actually be holding this other plate of uh, gluten-free uh, crackers for those who require or wish to have that. And I will also have the cup. So I just want to say that when you come, and receive the bread. You can take a, a moment for that. I mean, not a long moment necessarily, but be seen and see. And you can do the same when you receive the uh, cup. So we'll start in the back and then we'll work to this side, coming forward from the back row, moving forward. You'll come back and you'll actually come back this way, but not yet. We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you exactly when, okay? You guys are so eager. We love this. So, uh, and then we'll finish up with this side. Same thing. We'll go to that side and then circle back to your pews in the back. And anyone who needs to have the elements brought to them, such as Sandra, Alan, and I will do so. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from the dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will be scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We come this day in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service on behalf of all people. We ask you now to send your Holy Spirit upon this bread and cup and us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. And be present with us, O oh God, as we share this meal and throughout all our lives. In Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he died, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. Saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we offer you the bread. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup, and as he poured it out, he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. All is ready. Come to the table of the Lord.